Hello! Good day to each and everyone. For the previous videos, we have talked about how the plate tectonics theory has helped us in analyzing how plates have moved and what are the consequences of these movements in the formation of some of the tectonic features found on the Earth's crust. And now, for this video, we will be talking about what are some of the consequences of the deformation of our Earth's crust. So, sit back, relax, and enjoy this video presentation in the Moment of Science with Mr. Rabino. Deformation of the Earth's crust happens because the weight of the crust continuously changes over time. We know for the fact that our Earth's crust is just part of the lithospheric plates that rides on top of the plastic part of our mantle which we call as the asthenosphere. So for today's video, we are going to talk about the deformation of the Earth's crust and what are its subsequent effects on the Earth's surface. So allow me to share for today's video what I have prepared for you for this discussion. So we have just talked about how this deformation of the Earth's crust happens. So for this presentation, allow me to share first what I have found on the internet, some of the interesting memes that um, I found hilarious. So. These memes are somewhat related to our discussion for this afternoon. So allow me to share first the first meme to you. We have here the first meme. So it somewhat <laughs> reflects on our <laughs> location in the Pacific Ring of Fire. That this tectonic plates somewhat behave like those people <laughs> dancing on the picture. So and the other meme that I saw on the internet is this one. Okay, so somewhat we are in the middle of this geologic activities. And in fact, for the last weeks, we have experienced some tremors that can be felt um, here in our province of Cebu. Uh, if you could recall um, the latest earthquake that happened was way back I think that was last December 2 wherein there was a 6.9 earthquake that uh, happened and the epicenter of that earthquake is around in Davao City and in fact um, some of the people there were advised to go to highlands because of the tsunami alert released by the um, government agency now, what do I want to emphasize here? Because this meme somewhat tells us that from our discussion of the plate tectonics, we have understood the mechanisms of how the plate moves and at the same time, what are its effects on the Earth's crust. And we also talked about the formation of what we call as the plate boundaries and how the interaction of these plate boundaries result in the distinct tectonic feature that we see on the Earth's surface. Now, this has something to do with our discussion for this afternoon because the movements of these plates also causes deformation or shall we say... Um, the um what's the other term for deformation we call it uh, let's just refer to it as um the reconfiguration or shall we say the transformation or anything that is related to the word deformation so in many books we refer to the process of the deformation of the earth's crust resulting on different features as diastrophism so you may research on that term in the internet when we end this discussion but for the meantime i want you to go along with me as we discuss this deformation of the earth's crust and along with the effects that it brings to our community 
or at the same time to our environment. So, I have here a, an animation that will somewhat show you how the deformation of the Earth's crust happened for millions of years ago. Now, this GIF here shows you that the deformation of the Earth's crust doesn't happen instantly, but instead, it happens in a very slow process that, that this slow process accumulates over time, produces some of the changes that we observe in the Earth's surface, like the formation of mountains, the formation of volcanoes, and the formation of island arcs, volcanic arcs, so on and so forth. These are some of the many tectonic features that we can expect because of the movements that are happening in between the plates. Okay, now this deformation, as what I have said earlier, happens also because the weight of some part of the Earth's crust changes over time. And as this weight changes over time, some parts of the lithosphere also become very thick. And when this happens, the lithosphere becomes heavier. And when it becomes heavier, they tend to sink deeper into the asthenosphere. And likewise, if the lithosphere is thin and it becomes lighter since it is now thin, then the lithosphere rises higher in the asthenosphere. Now, the vertical motion or movement of this lithosphere depends on two opposing forces. Number one, of course, we can deduce that the force of gravity is also a factor that could um, influence the vertical movement of these lithospheric plates. Of course, the heavier the, the mass, the more it will be influenced by the force of gravity. And the other force is, of course, relative to, is related to the density of the crust itself, which is the buoyant force. Of course, the, the, the less dense the material, the more buoyant it is. And the denser the material, will, the less buoyant it becomes. And these forces interact with one another in the deformation of your crust. And when these two forces are balanced, the lithosphere at the same time and the asthenosphere is somewhat what we call in the state of isostasy. So this is a very important concept when we discuss about the deformation of the Earth's crust. Now, isostasy is a concept that is invoked to explain how different topographic heights can exist at Earth's surface. So in a nutshell, this is a transient non-elastic response of the Earth's lithosphere to loading and unloading due to erosion, deposition, water loading, desiccation, ice accumulation, and deglaciation. So somewhat, in our discussion on the endogenic and the exogenic processes, we have discussed them separately, how these two processes somewhat affect the formation of the different um, physical features that are formed on the Earth's surface. The endogenic processes and the exogenic processes exogenic process actually is related with one another because of this concept of isos isostasy. Now, how do we explain isostasy in a nutshell? So allow me to show to you this picture here. So let's just um, say, for example, um, we have here the left portion. When the gravitational forces equals the buoyant force, the lithosphere and asthenosphere are in a state of isostasy, meaning to say they are in a state of balance. But take note, if the erosion happens, it wears away the crust. And if it wears away the crust, the lithospheric plate above becomes lighter. And because the lithospheric plate above is now lighter, it will now cause the lithosphere or the asthenosphere to push the overlying crust because it is now much lighter. And as erosion continues, the isostatic adjustment also continues. Now, isostatic adjustments will continue to occur 
until it reaches a point wherein the buoyant force and the gravitational force becomes balanced. And this is what we refer to as the isostasy. Or in other books, we call this one as the isostatic adjustments itself. Now, the isostatic adjustments are very important. Like for example, in the explanation of mountains and isostasy, like for example, in many mountainous regions, the isostatic adjustments constantly occur. But over millions of years, the rock that forms mountains is worn away by the agents of erosion like wind, water, or even gravity. Or we can even include glaciers if the mountain is located on the, um, on the northern and southern hemispheres of our planet. And when this erosion happens, it can actually significantly reduce the height, not only the height, but also the weight of the mountain range, such as the one that is shown here in the figure. So we have here Mount Katadin in the Baxter State Park, Maine, which has been worn down by weathering. And as the mountain shrinks, the crust underneath it is uplifted. So, again, the isostatic happens because, of course, if erosion happens, the overlying crust becomes lighter. And if it becomes lighter, it becomes less dense. So, the tendency is that the asthenosphere will somewhat uplift or push the crust upward. And this kind of process is what we call as uplift or the uplifting of the Earth's crust because of the result of the erosion happening on the mountain. Okay? So, this is an one type of isostatic adjustment. Another type of iso isostatic adjustment occurs in um, rivers. Or in rivers, of course, the process of deposition is commonly happening because as rivers, they erode um, particles of rocks to where they flow. For example, the isostatic adjustment here occurs in areas where rivers carrying large amounts of muds, sand, you can even include gravel, which flow into a large bodies of water. And we know that rivers also connect to other bodies of water like seas, oceans. And as they are connected to these bodies of water, the particles that they carry with them are also deposited on these connected bodies of water and as a result the bodies of water where this deposition happens they also tend to become heavier and filled with matter and it becomes heavier it also becomes denser and as a result of this continuous deposition of these materials the added weight of the deposited material causes the ocean floor to sink because of the isostatic adjustment Okay, take note, the ocean floor becomes heavier, then technically it becomes denser. So, the, by virtue of isostatic adjustment, the crust will continue to sink because of its heavier materials being deposited um, by these agents of erosion. Like, well, this is actually a picture of the process that happens in the Gulf of Mexico at the mouth of the Mississippi River where a thick accumulation of these deposited materials are formed. So, that's another type of um, deposition, which we refer to as subsidence. Okay? So, another type of deposition is happening between gla glaciers. Okay? For example, the isostatic adjustments also occur as a result of the growth and retreat of glaciers and ice sheets. And when this large amount of water is held in glaciers and ice sheets, the weight of the ice causes the lithosphere beneath the ice to sink. And simultaneously, the ocean floor rises because the weight of the overlying ocean water is less. And when these glaciers and ice melts, the land that was covered with ice slowly rises as the weight of the crust decreases. And as the water returns to the ocean, the ocean floor also sinks in the process. So this is uh, the isostatic adjustment due to the movement of glaciers and 
ice sheets. So, why is this deformation very important? Because as this deformation happens, our Earth's crust also experiences what we call as stress. Okay? Because, of course, as the Earth's plates moves, the rock in the crust is either squeezed, they can either be stretched, or they are twisted in the process. And these actions, of course, exert force on the rock. And when the amount of force that is exerted on the rocks is somewhat too much for these rocks to handle, of course, the stress can be experienced by these rocks, which causes the deformation of these rocks. Okay? And during isostatic adjustments class, um, these forces are continuously being experienced by the rock particles. And as the lithosphere also sinks, the rock in the crust is squeezed and the direction of stress changes. And as the lithospheric plates also rises, then we can deduce that the rock in the crust is stretched in the direction of stress and the stress again changes its direction. So similarly, stress occurs in the Earth's crust when tectonic plates collide, separate, or when they scrape against each other, just like what we discussed in the plate boundaries. So there are different types of tr stress. Like number one, we have the compression, wherein plates or the rock particles are being squeezed or compressed uh, as a result. Uh, it could uh, reduce the volume of the rock. And compression also pushes rocks higher up or deeper down into the crust. And much of the stress that occurs near the convergent boundaries where tectonic plates collide is actually compression. Okay? Now, for tensional forces, as you can see in the direction of the arrow, um, it occurs when the movement of plates are pulling against each other. So, much like in the areas where divergent boundaries are usually happening. And for shear stress, uh, which is the third type of stress, it is um, a stress that distorts a body by pushing parts of the body in opposite directions. And the sheared rocks bend twist or break apart as they slide past each other. And shear stress is actually very common uh, in transform plate boundaries. Okay, So technically, these types of stresses can also be associated with plate boundaries. And as stress happens, strain also, uh, strain also happens. Because if stress is applied to rock, then rocks can be deformed and any change in the shape or volume of the rock that results from the stress is what you refer to as strain so actually in terms of strains we have different types of strains like for example the brittle strain uh, for brittle strain it appears as cracks or fractures but for ductile um, strain uh, it responds to stress by bending or deforming so there are, of course, different factors that affect the uh, strain of the rocks. Well, for example, temperature and pressure is involved in the process. But we are not going to focus on these kinds of um, discussion. But let's go first with some of the common types of strains. Number one is, of course, the fold. Usually, folding happens when there is uh, compressional forces. And a fold is a bend in the rock layers that results from stress and usually it is observed when flat layers of rocks were compressed or let's say they are squeezed inward and as stress is applied the rock layers bent and folded and cracks sometimes appear in or near a fold but most commonly the rock layers remain intact so usually uh we can associate this with, of course, the continental continent, continental collision where two continents collide, wherein since they are buoyant, uh, although one plate subducts over the other, uplift or shall we say upwarping occurs, and that results to what you call as the folded mountains. So, in the anatomy of a fold, so uh, we have here the part which we call as the limb, and where these two limbs meet with each other we call it as the hinge and of course 
the part here that somewhat uh, where this hinge and uh, where this hinge is um, found is we call this one as the actual plane now there are different types of folds so for example we have the anticline now it's an anticline if the fold that is found is that the oldest rock or the oldest rock is found on the inner layer if it's a syncline then the younger rock is found on the inner layer now how about for the monocline so if it's a monocline this is a type of fold in which both limbs are horizontal as you can see on the picture or almost horizontal okay then monoclines form when one part of the earth's crust moves up and down relative to another part and uh, usually uh, monoclines are typical to uh, layers wherein the movement of the earth's crust is up and down okay so these are the three types of fold as uh, described in the effects of strain another type of effects of strain is what we call as the fold okay now the creation of fold of course is uh, very obvious because stress does not only deform rocks but at the same time they also produce what we call as faults now there are, we have to make some distinction here when we refer to the break along which there is no movement of the surrounding rock we call it as fracture but if it's a break in which the surrounding rock moves then we call it as a fault and the surface or plane along which this motion occur is what we call as the fault plane and usually the surface or plane along which the motion occurs is um, the fault plane and in a non-vertical fault uh, usually the hanging wall is the rock above the fault plane and the foot wall is the rock below the fault plane now there are several types of faults number one we have the normal fault and we can actually distinguish these types of faults based on the direction of the movements of their plates for example in the normal fault it's caused by tensional forces and due to these tensional forces that occur in the normal fault the hanging wall is directly below the foot wall okay that's an example that's what we call as normal fault in the reverse fault because of the compressional forces or shall we say the squeezing force experienced by the rocks the hanging wall now is now above the foot wall now a thrust fault is somewhat a type or a special type of the reverse fault wherein the rock and the hanging wall is pushed up over the foot wall at an extremely low angle okay so that is uh, a thrust fault and usually because of the low angle of the fault plane the rock of the hanging wall is pushed up and over the rock of the foot wall and usually the reverse faults and thrust faults are common in steep mountain ranges okay well that is very easy to analyze because if the mountain is very steep then technically the underlying rock will be pushing the uh, the rock at a lower angle so that's why reverse or thrust faulting is common on those areas like for example for normal forward faulting a good example for this is the great east african rift valley then for reverse fault we have the rocky mountains um, here so this is the picture on the left side showing the process of the thrust faulting and this is the actual picture of the mountain itself okay now another type of fault is what we call as the strike slip fault now in a strike slip fault this is caused by the shear stress okay the one that we discussed earlier now of course in the shear stress um, rocks instead of colliding or diverging with one another they actually slide past each other 
horizontally in response to the shear stress. And they got their name because they slide or slip parallel to the direction of the length or strike of the fault. And usually, um, the strike-slip fault is common in areas where transform plate boundaries occur. Like for example, in the picture here, we have the San Andreas Fault which is found in Carolina. It stretches over 1,200 kilometers across California and is the result of the two tectonic plates moving in different directions. Okay? So, those are the types of faults that result because of the stress experienced by the rocks which also result to what we call as strain. So, I will have to end my discussion here and we will continue this one in the part 2 of our discussion on the deformation of the Earth's crust. So, I will stop here because the next discussion that you will follow here will be on the process of how mountains are formed. So, allow me to end this video right now. So, in summary, we learned that deformation of the crust happens because of the changing weight of the Earth's crust and that as the change of the Earth's crust weight happens, there is also an isostatic adjustment happening as a result of this uh, as a result of this changing weight due to the exogenic processes happening on the Earth's crust like weathering and erosion. And these isostatic adjustments allows crust to experience continuous deformation which results to stress. And at the same time, as stress is experienced by these rocks, then strain also happens along the surface of our rocks, which gave rise to the different deformations that occur in our Earth's crust, in our Earth's crust rather. And as a result of this deformation, we observe different physical features found on the Earth's surface. So, for the next discussion, we will be talking about the how mountains are formed and the process as a result of this deformation of crust. So, I will have to end my first part of my lecture here. So, I hope that you have learned something out from our discussion. So, once again, this has been your uh, lecturer uh, signing off and saying that uh, I hope you have learned something out from what we have talked about for this afternoon. So, goodbye everyone and see you on the next part of this video. Bye!